Feeling the chill? Certainly, we are here in Chicago. And to blame, the polar vortex. This is a cold pocket of air near the poles. Some of this cold air has been sent southward, well to the south, impacting parts of the Midwest and the Great Lakes. And this has been a long duration cold snap for us. We have had days in a row with our temperatures below that freezing mark. We want to talk a little bit more about the polar vortex. So we met up with Illinois state climatologist Trent Ford to discuss this in more detail. I know you have so many facts in your head, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, touch base with you. You've been, how long have you been working as the state climatologist in Illinois? It's almost been a year and a half now. It's, okay. it's flown by. Despite the pandemic, it's, it's really flown by. The term polar vortex is just thrown around so much in the media that I think folks that are, you know, just watching the news, um, I want them to have like the best understanding of exactly what this is, because it's not something you can see. It's not something that just happens. The polar vortex isn't a weather event. It's there. It's been there. It's always been there. So I just wanted to talk to you and just expand on exactly what this stratospheric cold pocket of air is. Yeah. So, so you mentioned it. So the polar vortex, when it's when it's when it's brought up in not just the media, but now it's a public lay term. It's it's really referenced when we have a a, a burst of cold air, um, and, and usually is then associated with um, what comes from a very large um, anomaly in the subpolar jet stream here in the troposphere, the area of the atmosphere that we're in, and um, <clears throat> but in fact. The, 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 the troughing of the jet stream that allows that really cold air at the surface to come barreling down from the Arctic is actually the, 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 the main mechanism for that, or one of the main mechanisms is the true polar vortex, which is a, uh, a, a like you mentioned, a pocket of cold air with east to west rotating winds around it in the stratosphere, the layer of the atmosphere above the troposphere. Rough, I mean, it varies, but roughly 18 miles above the surface, uh, in, at least the surface in Chicago. And so um, that's well above where your commercial airliner will fly. And so that, that polar vortex, as you mentioned, is, it's always there. It, it's, it's, it's there in the summertime. It weakens, it strengthens, it, it moves somewhat. It's got um, different uh, orientations to it at different times. And, and it's really most relevant to our weather in the winter time, in the boreal winter where we are now. And so, as you mentioned, you know, the the it's always there. It's just we don't hear about it until it's affecting us, right? Um, uh, there are other kinds of weather like that as well that they're always there, but it doesn't really affect uh, until it actually impacts us. Um, and so, yeah, I, the 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 stratospheric polar vortex. Um, what makes it associated with these really cold air outbreaks is we get a disruption in the typical strong east-west flow around that pocket of cold air. Um, and those are caused, the disruption is, is often caused by something called the Rossby wave, which is this large scale, continental scale atmospheric wave. Use the term wave, kind of like water, right? We have a peak, we have a trough in the wave. It, 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 it functions in that way. And when we get those Rossby waves that can crash onto the, the, the stratospheric polar vortex, again, way up in the atmosphere, what it can do is it can slow those winds, those, those east-west winds, and actually in some cases reverse them, and which causes some of that cold air in the stratosphere to sink really rapidly towards the surface. Um, and, and as it sinks, it gets warmer as, as the atmosphere tends to uh, close to the surface. Um, and so that's what's called the stratospheric sudden stratospheric sudden warming event. Um, and those occur, or when those occur, it can um, make for a, a really anomalous flow, a really unusual flow for for the the uh, the subpolar jet stream that actually affects or actually creates that cold air outbreak here at the surface. And so, the key is about the polar vortex and, and its relationship, though, is that it's a bit like a roulette wheel, right? Where just because we have a sudden stratospheric warming event and the, the, the stratospheric polar vortex gets out of whack does not mean it's going to get really cold here. Um, it, it could not, not really get 
extremely cold anywhere in the in the northern hemisphere except the Arctic. All that polar stays there, or it could have it could create a branch of that polar of that subpolar jet stream uh, in Eurasia or in northern Europe or in Alaska uh, and in the west coast. And so, um, again, just that that the the disruption of the stratospheric polar vortex does not always make for extremely uh, cold conditions. It's just when we're the unlucky souls to be under the influence of that big trough in the in the in the subpolar jet stream. You know, the thing about 2019 was it was extremely cold for a handful of days, and then it it, it moderated. What I'm finding interesting about this event is how stinking persistent it has been, and and it is forecasted to be. And it we've is had likely five inches of snow in the past 15 to 16 days. Yeah. Except for today, we hit 21 degrees. I thought we were going to get consecutive days under 20 for this stretch just to make it noteworthy. But again, yeah. just so many days here below freezing temperatures. And like you said, the long range forecast is, is showing these temperatures staying below 32, at least for the next five to 10 days. That's right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, you know, looking at some of these model and, and some of the expert discussions from the Climate Prediction Center, they're like, yeah, we should see a moderating, you know, of temperatures by the end of the month, you know, and yeah. it's like, whoa, what, what was that? I think I missed that. So, um, yeah, you're right. It's been, it's been, it's been persistence. Um, again, we, when we get polar, uh, the, 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 the polar vortex forcing of that jet stream, you know, the, the jet stream in, in the, here in the, near the surface, the, in the troposphere, it, it also tends to operate somewhat like a wave. It has a wave, a, a wave like pattern. Um, and sometimes that, that wave-like pattern tends to moderate and flow more straight west to east, that zonal flow. Um, but when it does have a big trough uh, in its flow, typically there's another associated ridge on the other side, either downstream or upstream. And depending on the orientation of that wave train, what you can get is uh, blocking that sets up that can and, and more persistence of certain patterns. And so, um, and that's what we're seeing here. So it's not just that okay, we get a couple cold days and then we go back to warmer than normal or, or near normal conditions, it, it's persisting for that long. And I think, um, you know, the, the snowfall that we've been getting, pretty pretty consistent snowfall. Um, I, I, I was looking at the, the data and I think uh, National Weather Service in Chicago posted on this that you're getting close to the uh, top three uh, longest days of like over 10 inches of snowpack, which is, is really something. Yeah, I want to say the record is kind of crazy, like 48 days in a row or something. Yeah. I could be mistaken. I want to double check that. But um, yep, it is 48 days. Uh, that happened in the winter of 1978 and 79. Yeah. But we are number eight right now. So okay. it's pretty incredible. And the snowpack, 14 inches or more, looks to stay around. And we're going to continue to add to it That's as we right. head into the next week. Yeah, this is pretty pretty crazy. But I do want to touch on, you know, it's not that intuitive to say, you know, stratospheric warming is mm -hmm. really the cause of this polar vortex and the shift and the deviation that we're seeing. That's, that's kind of hard to grasp. And what I really want to talk about is once it gets really cold like this, a lot of people start saying, some people I should say, oh, global warming, it's not a thing, but they're two completely separate sure. things. The global warming relates to the average temperature across the globe. That doesn't necessarily mean we're not going to see extreme heat events as well as extreme uh, cold events, Arctic outbreaks. And sometimes um, when or, or we'll talk about the climate uh, relation next, but if you just want to touch on that. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, so global warming specifically, and I say specifically because it's used to describe a lot of things and it really shouldn't be. Global warming only refers to the increase in global average temperature that we've seen over the last 100 to 150 years. And it is there, it is, it is consistent. Um, and <clears throat> the vast majority of places, when you look at just average temperature, the vast majority of places on earth have warmed at a significant rate over the last 100 years. Um, however, uh, global warming causes climate change, which is really what we tend to focus on in a lot of aspects of life. And um, some changes in our climate here in Illinois have been consistent with, with global warming, as in increases. So wintertime temperature has increased at a, at a pretty significant, at a, at a significant rate over the last 100 years. Um, 
And, and some of our climate changes haven't really. So summertime maximum temperature, for example, in Chicago has not increased over that time period at a significant rate. And, and so with all that being said, despite those changes, um, we still have weather vary and climate variability that is imposed on climate change. So we think about the climate change as the kind of the background where it's, it's consistently, the, the trend is consistently warmer. You know, as we think about a trend, you know, a flat line going up or going down, but the variability on top of it is still going on. And in some cases they interact but what you're talking about, you know, the fact that we've had this 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 pretty brutal cold for the last few days and looks like it's going to be the next week or so, does not disprove the the fact that we have a, a warming trend. Uh, it's still possible to get cold, and and we will continue to get cold weather in the winter time uh, here in Chicago, uh, despite continued uh, climate change into the future. Um, and and you know, proof of that, we we broke our all time state minimum temperature record uh, two years ago in 2019 uh, in Mount Carroll. Right. Now, Mount Carroll has a pretty long observing. Uh, I think it goes back, that station goes back to maybe the 1800s, if not the early 20th century. Um, and if you look at wintertime temperatures, the trend is statistically significant. So despite the fact that that station broke the record, um, it has been warming at a rate of about half a degree Fahrenheit per decade over the last hundred years. So um, they're, they are, as you mentioned, they're two separate things. Um, and um, although uh, because of that warming trend in winter, the frequency of extremely cold nights has decreased in Chicago. But again, just because of that doesn't mean that uh, we can't still get extremely cold nights. It just makes it less likely. Exactly. And in relation to climate, there's a lot of research going into this right now. I mean, we're trying to study this. It's, it's super hard to say, you know, exactly what global warming is causing, but it does appear that there is a trend of more extreme events happening, not only here locally, but also across the globe. But here locally, take for instance, 2019, when we had that extreme cold, we set that record low temperature. Here we are in 2021, we're talking about a long duration of a of extreme cold. It's not as cold, but it's definitely still dangerously cold out there. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a connection and a correlation between climate change and global warming, allowing for these polar vortex mm -hmm. type of situations that we're talking about to become more frequent? Yeah, that is a really good question. And so there is a, there is ongoing research and a lot of research has been done to connect um, winter time uh, extreme events, um, uh, extreme snowfall events, blizzards, um, and and uh, an extreme cold to climate change to see if there is that relationship. Um, as far as the polar vortex is concerned, there is research and evidence that there is a relationship between long-term warming, um, uh, especially in the Arctic, and the polar vortex. Now, I mentioned global warming causes changes in climate in different places. Uh, the place, the area of the globe that's gotten the warmest, the highest rate is the Arctic, is the, is the, the northern, uh, the North Pole, essentially. And uh, that's where the stratospheric port, uh, vortex is, is typically located with that. So what that means is we're decreasing Arctic sea ice, which means there's a lot more energy exchange between the ocean, because there is an ocean at the North Pole, um, that, that warmer ocean water and the overlying colder atmosphere in the winter. And that does affect the energy dynamics, do affect the stratospheric polar vortex, and could possibly make for, for more conducive conditions or more likely to have, to have these sorts of cold air outbreaks. One of the other uh, connections that we've seen in the literature is um, that reduction, that, that, that decrease in sea ice extent in the Arctic. Uh, it, it not only affects the polar vortex and the stratosphere, it also affects the, su the, the, the subpolar jet stream. When I talk about here near the surface, the, the actual uh, bringer of the cold air down to us. Um, and, and overall, what it can do, or what it's been linked to, is a slowing down of that, of that jet stream. And when that jet stream slows, it tends to be more wavy. And when I talk about that waviness, right, we get more deeper troughs, more deeper ridges, more high ridges, and, and, and more persistence. Um, and so, you know, although, as you mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting and difficult area of research, um, so I, I can't get on here and say, um, absolutely, this is what's causing it, and, uh, but there are those connections, there's evidence to that, 
Um, which is again another really important uh, point uh, is that you know global warming is just that increase in global average temperature, but it can cause impacts uh, that um, that you would think are kind of antithetical or opposite of warming, and that can be an, an increase in in um, in extreme cold, for example. And what do you see uh, in these extreme? cold events in relation to Chicago and the impacts on the economy here if these were to become more frequent? Yeah, so uh, human health, I think, is is one of the biggest. Um, you know, I, just like any uh, populated area, uh, the number of, of homeless and those that are vulnerable to extreme cold, that, that's always a problem um, with when it comes to extreme cold. You know, extreme heat has a similar effect, but uh, extreme cold, when the temperature gets below freezing for a prolonged period of time, it can be really challenging for those who don't have shelter, for example. Other than that, thinking about infrastructure, um, extreme cold has a, has a pretty prolific impact on infrastructure. So roads and bridges, when you get that cold, the steel, the concrete, the asphalt, it contracts, and then you have issues, it becomes more brittle. Uh, and then when you get well, uh, three, four inches of snow or more on top of it, you get the plows that can that can cause some some pretty significant damage to the roadways. So because of that, so um, also you have uh, uh, issues with the steel in rail. Yeah. So railways uh, contract and can. Fire. Uh, yeah, exactly right. They light them on fire to expand them to get the train through because the width of the of the bottom of the train is uh, is set to the width of the tracks, and so when those tracks contract, it creates a problem. So that, that that definitely there are economic impacts to that. Also, when we think about energy demand, you know, um, uh, the folks who are making decisions about about energy supply uh, for, for example, the Chicagoland area are doing so mainly based off of off of long term trends because they're not making those decisions for tomorrow. You know, thankfully, they're making decisions five, ten years out to make sure that there's adequate energy supply. And so despite the fact that we get these warming trends in winter, when we have this cold air outbreak, it really taxes the energy demand system. Um, and so, so there are tangible impacts to extreme cold for sure. Um, the last one, ecological impacts, um, you know, especially when we get these cold snaps in the middle of an otherwise very warm winter or early spring, it can create some some issues with uh, buds on trees freezing and and significant damage to um, to perennials and to trees as well. So definitely impacts from those extreme cold events. That is for sure something we are going to have to continue to watch and monitor mm -hmm. as we go into the future. Um, and talking about the future, <laughs> climatologists, forecaster, meteorologists, we are we are always looking into the future. So oh, yeah. I'm sure folks want to know. When do we think this is going to let up? When are we gonna get some mild temperatures? And also your thoughts on the ice cover that is just crazy expanding in the Great Lakes and across Lake Michigan, which could, a lot of impacts there, but could also start to turn off the lake effect snow machine if we get the ice to continue to build. That's right, yeah. I um, So I did a, a webinar last month for just kind of an update on conditions for the entire North Central region from Ohio all the way to Wyoming. And um, the Ohio State Climatologist sent me a figure that showed um, uh, lake ice in uh, Erie, in Lake Erie. And I think it was at like 1.4%. Yeah. I looked yesterday and it was at like 78%. And it, Lake Erie is not the size of Lake Michigan, but it's not far behind. It was amazing, the expansion. And I've seen pictures of Lake Michigan and some of the rivers. Um, I, think, I think it was the Rock River where they had pancake ice on it the other day. So... Yeah, the, the rapid ice formation is um, is really it it, it it's interesting, um, and as you mentioned, it shuts off that lake effect snow belt, uh, so it makes for less snow, especially on the downwind side on the lakes in in Michigan and Indiana. Um, there are a couple issues with ice. First, I guess to go back to answer your first question, it looks like uh, based off of the the kind of short to medium range outlooks and forecasts that. Temperatures will begin to moderate towards the beginning of the week after next. Yeah. Uh, I know that it sounds like a long time away. We can make it through one more week, but um, it <laughs> looks like temperatures get closer to normal. And then the, the outlooks for March, for February, March, and April together as a three-month showed warmer than average conditions, 
which uh, tell us that the models uh, for March and April are, are leaning towards warmer than average or warmer than normal. So, so um, you know, despite the fact that we had this cold air outbreak, uh, it will end. I do promise it will end at some point and maybe we'll have a nice spring because of it. Other than the lake effect snow, one of the things we will have to look for uh, as we move into spring is ice damming and ice jamming of the rivers. And so um, it wasn't really an issue and hasn't been an issue this winter so far because it's been relatively warm in December and January. However, um, spring into late into, into early summer is our wettest time of the year. And when it's also the time of the year we get a lot of extreme precipitation events, At the same time our snow is melting and that ice on the, on the rivers also begins to melt and break apart. Uh, making it more likely that we have those ice ice jams. And, uh, and, and of course, when we get an ice jam on our rivers, even the small tributaries, we can have uh, pretty significant flooding events. So that is something because of this cold, uh, despite the fact that it hasn't been overly wet, it's been a little bit uh, wetter, than, wetter than normal over the last 30 days, um, we will need to look out towards the end of this month into March for those, those ice dams along our, uh, along our rivers in Northern Illinois, especially. It seems every winter, you know, we get that one period or that period of time where we're talking about the ice jams and the rivers and it doesn't take much here in our area. Our basins are pretty full and we've yeah. experienced some pretty wet weather over the past couple of years as well. I mean, look at the lake levels, for example. I mean, we could talk yeah. for hours on all of this. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, but you're right. I mean, it's very rare. The soils are a little bit drier uh, now than they, than they were this time last year, the year before. So that helps build that capacity when that snow does begin to melt, it'll infiltrate a little bit better, but it is, it's going to be March in Illinois. We're going to get rain. It's some of it's going to be heavy rain at the same time as that ice breaks apart, it could cause those ice jams. And so that is something that folks should be aware of that, you know, just because we get to warmer weather doesn't mean we don't have the impact from the ice still. Yes. All right. Well, I just cannot thank you enough. We're going to get through this cold snap. I don't even know if we can call it a cold snap anymore. It's like, it's longer than a snap. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> we need to snap our fingers and change this forecast, get some warmer weather. And thank you so much for your insight. I hope people learned a lot from this and hopefully we can stay in touch and connect yeah. more because March is right around the corner and we're going to be transitioning right out of this cold into severe weather season and you're That's just right. saying models are indicating warmer than average wetter than average so it could be an active spring for us something we're gonna have yeah. to definitely monitor um but Absolutely. we're so grateful for you spending some time with us today yeah well thank you so much for inviting me and, and yeah anytime i'm happy to 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 talk to a, a fellow weather weenie as much as i can it's always fun hey if you like that video be sure to subscribe to our abc7 chicago youtube channel